Well, good morning and uh, warm welcome to our service uh, today from the Free Church uh, in Kinloch. And we pray that the Lord will bless us today as we share together uh, from his word. We're going to begin our service. We're going to sing in the metrical Psalm 93 from the beginning of the psalm. The Lord doth reign and clothed is he with majesty most bright. His works to show him clothed to be and girt about with might. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and we praise Thee, Lord, for this privilege that we have once again today of coming together around Thy Word. And we pray that all the honour and the praise and the glory would belong unto Thee, for Thou art worthy (coughs) of praise and glory and thou art indeed worthy of our worship. And so we pray at the outset of our service today that the desire of our hearts would be to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And so we ask, Lord, for thy blessing to be upon each and every one of us as we share together today from thy word, as we share in worship together We pray that thou would be near to us and that thou might apply thy word to us, thy word sung, 
thy word read, thy word expounded upon, that thou might apply it to our hearts by the power of thy spirit, that it may become alive in our experience, that it may transform us today, O Lord, for thy word has that transforming power, that it may transform us today to the end that for the first time we come into a loving and saving relationship with thyself, and that it may speak to us in a manner in which we grow in our holiness, that it be toward our sanctification. Sanctify us, Lord, through thy truth, for thy word indeed is the truth. And so we pray then, O Lord, our God, on this day anew, that thou would bless each and every one of us. Bless those, Lord, today who are listening to this service, who are watching the service. We pray that there may be for each one of us a word from the Lord. We give thanks again today that we are able to gather in this way, that these means, Lord, and this technology has been given to us even for such a time as this, that the gospel, the word of God, that it may go forth, and that men and women and young people are able to hear these services. And so we give thanks, Lord, for the means that thou hast provided for us in these days. We give thanks again today for our Lord and for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for all that he means to those of us who have come to know him and come to love him, those for whom he has become a saviour, those who have been brought from death to life, those who have been brought from darkness into a most marvellous light, those whose feet are now upon a rock, and those who have a new song in their mouths that praises and magnifies the Lord. We thank thee for the means that thou hast provided in and through the person of thy Son who came into this world, took upon himself our nature, became a man even without sin, and ultimately, O Lord, died in our room and in our place, offering his spotless and stainless life as a sacrifice for his own people. And we praise and we thank thee today, those of us who have come into a saving relationship with him, that his spotless, beautiful life has been imputed to each and to every one of us, so that we may stand before thee, justified, O Lord, in thy presence. And so we give thanks for him and for the work of his grace in our lives, <clears throat> for him who intervened in our lives. For, O Lord, if he had not come to us, we undoubtedly would not have gone to him. And so we thank thee for this great gift that thou hast given to us and imparted to us. What grace has done in our experience, Lord, what nothing else could do, what nothing else could attain. O oh Lord, we give thanks then today for amazing grace and its sweet sound that saved wretches such as we were, those who were blind now see, and those who were lost are now found. And so we praise thee and we thank thee for all that he has done for us. We thank thee for his life, for his death. We thank thee that he was raised for our justification. We thank thee that he ascended up on high, and that now he is at thy right hand, where he continually intercedes on behalf of his own beloved people. And so, Lord our God, today we pray that we would stop for a moment and give thanks for that saving work having taken place in our experience, even in the midst, Lord, of everything that is in our lives today, and maybe all the difficulties and challenges that we uh, face individually, we can sit back and we can give thanks for the one thing that is sure, that one thing that was needful, 
that one thing that cannot be taken from us, that not even death itself will separate us from, and that is the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, the love of God for his people, for those that he gave to the Son from before the foundation of the world. And so then, O Lord our God, today we pray uh, that we would be thankful if we are thy people, and that if we are not yet thy people, that the desire of our hearts today would be to close in with Christ, that we too today might cry the prayer of, one, of another, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And those who call upon the name of the Lord will not be turned away. He will hear their cry, and he will respond to their pleas. And so we pray then, O Lord, uh, today that those who are yet without Christ, that maybe even today might be the day when they find him and go spiritually to the place where he died and there find life and that in all of its fullness. O Lord our God, we pray that it would be so. And so bless us, we pray. Bless our world today. Bless our nation. Bless our communities. In the midst, Lord, of the ongoing crisis that faces us, we pray that we would, even through all these things, be able to discern the voice of the Lord in these things speaking to us. And we pray today for all, Lord, who have been affected by COVID-19, for the many families that we hear of from day to day and from week to week who have lost loved ones, who have lost loved ones and haven't even maybe been able to say goodbye. We pray for all such today, Lord. We commit them unto thee. And we pray for all who mourn and all who grieve and all who are maybe worried too about friends and family and loved ones in intensive care in hospital. We commit them all into thy care and keeping, Lord, praying that thou wilt bring comfort to them, that they might by thy grace be enabled to turn to thee and look to thee, that they might come to the place where they would concede. To whom else can we go but unto him who has the words of eternal life? And so we pray for all such today, Lord, and we pray for all those who are on the front line, those who look after us, Lord, and those in our hospitals, our medical professionals, Lord, uh, and all who work in the health care, all who work in homes, Lord, and who bring care into care homes and care into the community. We commit every single one of them unto thee and give thanks for them and for the skills, Lord, that you have given to them. We thank thee for each and for every one, and we pray that thou might keep them safe, Lord, in these days. We thank thee for our own island communities, for our own doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, for our own local surgery here. We thank thee for each and for every one, and we thank thee for the measure in which thou hast protected us over these days up till this point. And so we pray that we might stop as a people and give thanks unto thee for thy goodness to us. And so we commit all these things to thee. We commit ourselves to thee. Keep us, Lord, we pray. Cause us all to look unto thyself, that thou might be unto us a refuge, that thou might be unto us a strength in our time of need. And so bless us now together. Bless thy word to us. Bless thy word read, thy word sung. And we pray that it would be manna uh, to our hearts today, that it would feed our souls to the glory and to the praise of thine own name. We pray all things in and through Christ and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> uh, we're going to read God's word uh, today in the Gospel of John, and we're going to read from uh, John chapter 13, reading, picking up the reading at the verse 31 and reading down uh, to the end of verse 6 in chapter 14. <clears throat> John 13 and at verse 31. So when he had gone out, that is Judas Iscariot, 
But Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Yet let not your, your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. May the Lord bless to us that reading from his own holy and inspired word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. While seeking the Lord's help and the, the Lord's guidance, I, I want us to uh, go back to our reading this morning in, in John chapter 14, and we'll read again uh, the words that we have uh, in the verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? Uh, and especially these words, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, these verses, uh, which are familiar to most of us, I'm sure, uh, are a part of the discourse that the Lord had with the disciples in the upper room after the Lord's Supper was instituted. Uh, and as Jesus speaks these words, uh, we know that he is coming face to face himself with the reality of the cross. And more than that, the disciples were beginning to understand and beginning to, to realize that the Lord was going away and that the three-year relationship uh, between them and himself, that that was coming to an end. And so in, in the midst of, of their confusion and their uncertainty, uh, the disciples, they begin to question Jesus. They begin to ask him questions. After Jesus had said in chapter 13, as we read, that he was going away from the disciples, Peter, in response, he asks Jesus, well, where are you going? And then here, a few moments later, Thomas comes and he asks Jesus the same question, but maybe in a slightly different way. Thomas says, Lord, we do, don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? We know that you are going away, but we don't know where you are going, so how is it that we are going to know the way? And it is to that question that we get the response we have in our text. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except he come or she come 
through me. Now, these words of Jesus that are contained within this text of Scripture are words that the disciples should have received with joy and with thanksgiving. And they are words that we should receive ourselves, my friends, with that same joy and thanksgiving. Jesus' response to Thomas's question was a comprehensive response to his question, but it was also an exclusive uh, response, in a sense, to the question. There was an exclusivity involved in that response to Thomas's question as well. How can we know the way? I am the way. I am the only way, the truth and the life. Comprehensive and exclusive. If you remember before sin entered into the world that our first parents, uh, Adam and Eve, that, that, that they enjoyed what we might call today a, a threefold privilege as far as their relationship to God the Father was concerned. It was a threefold privilege, along with many other privileges. But first, they were in perfect, uninterrupted communion and fellowship with God. There was no interruption in that communion. They were close to God. They had fellowship with God. And secondly, they, they, they knew God, and they, and they knew the truth that flowed from God. They knew that. They knew it all, my friends. And thirdly, they, had, they possessed spiritual life as well. But as we know, as we well know, they, they disobeyed God and instantly they lost these three glorious privileges that they had. And so instead of enjoying communion and fellowship with God, they experienced alienation from God. A gulf came between themselves and the God who had fellowshiped with them and the God who had created them. That gulf came into that relationship. And instead of knowing the truth, they fell into error and they fell into falsehood. And instead of possessing life, they began to know death. My friends, this, like it or not, is also our human condition. We are in our natural state. We are alienated from God. And we are ignorant of the truth. And we are condemned to spiritual and eventually physical death. And so this claim of Christ that we have here in this verse is a divine answer to our threefold problem. Instead of alienation, there is now the way. And instead of ignorance and error, there is in him the truth. And instead of death, there is now life. This is the threefold answer to the losses and the impact of what happened in Eden. This, in a sense, is the last Adam reversing what the first Adam had brought into the experience of the human race. And the first thing that we see here is quite simply, Jesus is the way. And what we have there is reconciliation. When Jesus declares here to Thomas and to the other disciples, when he declares that he is the way, it would surely instinctively bring to their minds, as it should bring to our own minds, a path from one point to another. The way is like a bridge, if you like, that spans a great chasm. Maybe if you think of it like, 
like these rope bridges that you see sometimes maybe in films and, 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 and on the telly uh, that people walk over to, to get from one side uh, of a great chasm or, or a valley or whatever it is to, to the other side. And, and that bridge, that rope bridge might be the only way to cross because there is no other way and there is no other possibility. You cannot get from one point to the other without this way, without this bridge. And the two points here, if we are to see that there are two points, the two points here that need to be bridged is the way, my friends, from man's total ruin to the Father. It is the way from death to life that needs to be bridged. The way is the, the means of travelling, if you like, from, from our fallen condition, from the fallen condition of natural mankind into the perfect presence of Almighty God. And Jesus is the way. He is the only way. And Jesus and his finished work on behalf of his people is the bridge between the two points. From man's total ruin into the presence of God the Father. You see, we are not saved, my friends, we are not saved by our own works. We are not saved by some principle. We are not saved by some idea. We are not saved by some philosophy, not at all. We are saved by a person. We are saved by a unique person. And this unique person is the one who could say of himself, I am. He is the highway of holiness that was foretold of by Isaiah the prophet hundreds of years before this, over which the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. And so Jesus is the way from man's total ruin to a perfect relationship and fellowship with God the Father, that relationship and fellowship that had been lost so long ago in Eden. But what do we actually mean when we talk here about this point of man's total ruin? Well, we mean every man and every woman's total ruin, my friends, in sin. As we mentioned from the moment that our first parents sinned against God in Eden, we, we have all been infected by this disease of, of original sin. And that disease alienates us from our Creator. It alienates us from God himself, the one who created us. And so our problem really is how can this sin be put away? How can it be dealt with? How can we get rid of it in a sense? How can reconciliation take place between us in our ruin and the Father? Are we just to hope in God's mercy? Is that all we are to do? Well, you see, my friends, an act of mercy that does not also satisfy the claims of justice is unworthy of the great God of the universe. So how then will sin be removed? How then will this reconciliation, how will it take place? Oh, the only way is the way which God has revealed in Jesus Christ. God has sent his own son. He sent his son who took on himself our nature, made a man, 
to enter into to a covenant union with his people so, so that he becomes one with them. And so because of that, he is eligible, isn't he, to bear their sin upon himself. He undertakes to be his people's substitute. He undertakes to die in their place, bearing in his own body and in his own soul God's just wrath against sin. And then by his death, removing the guilt and punishment of that sin forever. And so, so my friends, as a result of Christ's death in the place of his people, sin has been blotted out. Sin has been forgiven. Sin has been forgotten. And reconciliation takes place. When God looks upon his people, it is as if they had never sinned at all, in a sense. He cannot see it. Their sin is cast into the ocean of his forgetfulness, and he cannot then but be reconciled to them. The sins are gone. And that great chasm that separated those in total ruin at one point and fellowship and communion with the Father in heaven at the other, that has been bridged by the finished work of Christ. And so he is the way. And so you see, the disciples here had to learn that he must go away so that he can become the way. The way to the house of many mansions. If, he, if they were to go to the house of many mansions, he had to go away to provide the way. He must go away so that he may through his death and resurrection become this great means of reconciliation that he might become the way, the only way. I am the way. I wonder if it is in this way that you are trusting today. I wonder if your faith and your trust is in Christ who is the way, who is the only way. I wonder if you desire to go to heaven. Well, if you do, and if you want to go to heaven, and I'm quite sure you all want to go to heaven, and we would all want to go to heaven, if you do, then Christ is the way. Christ is the only way. Christ is the only bridge that there is between death and life. Christ is the only reconciliation, the only means of reconciliation, the only one who can provide a way for you from that one point of total ruin to be able to stand justified in the sight of Almighty God. And so he is the way, reconciliation. But secondly, he also claims to be the truth. And we can say of this, revelation. Reconciliation, then revelation. The word truth in the Greek language, it quite simply, I think, means without being hidden or concealed. That is a very basic understanding of the word. The idea is of that which is seen or that which is expressed as it really is. I suppose you could use the simple example of, 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 of a witness at a court case. When that witness is about to, to, to give evidence and is asked, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And the witness responds, I do. 
And so the question that has been asked, in a sense, of that witness is really, are you willing to come into this courtroom and manifest something that is hidden to us that only you know so that you will bear true evidence to that? In other words, when you speak the truth, you are manifesting a hidden reality. Truth is the declaration that describes the reality. And you see, Jesus Christ is the way because Jesus Christ is the truth. Because Jesus Christ is God revealed to, to us. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the brightness of the Father's glory. He is the express image of his person. He is the truth about the Father. But what do we see in Jesus about God the Father? Well, what is the reality of which this truth speaks? What do we learn about the reality, if you like? Well, surely we learn as we look at Jesus. Surely we learn of God the Father that God is personal. Surely we learn that God is not an impersonal force in the universe. Surely we learn that God is not impersonal, not at all. Because he is a God who desires surely to, to communicate with people and wants them to know him. And through Jesus Christ, who is the truth, surely we have come to know and to understand that reality. But also more than that, surely, we see the reality that God is holy. You see, we cannot learn that God is holy by looking in any other direction. You can look at the creation and you know that God is powerful. You know that he is a, a sustaining God. There are many things about God that you can learn even in just looking around you. But in looking around you and in every day, but there is no other direction in which you can look to understand the reality that God is holy and to look at Christ, to look at Jesus. We see as we look at him that God is indeed a holy God. Because we see in Christ, we see that he is and lived without sin. And he declares that God the Father is like himself in his holiness. And, and you know, my friends, more than that itself, do we not discern and do we not see as we look at Jesus paying the wages of our sins on the cross that God the Father, that he is holy? And as we look at all that Christ bears on that cross, we come to understand that God in his holiness cannot tolerate sin. He had to turn away even from the sin of his people that Christ bore, whereby Christ would cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father is holy and he cannot tolerate sin and he must deal with sin. And he dealt with the sins of his people in his son Christ. But didn't Jesus also reveal that God is also a God of mercy? He, he is a God of love, surely that reality comes forth as well as we look at Jesus. Even when justice was required, God came to people willing to die for them in their place and so providing for them peace and joy and all of the other blessings that come with the Christian life. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died in our place. And so the reality is 
as we look at the truth there, as we, as we perceive the reality, the reality is that a personal, holy, and a loving God is the reality that is revealed by the truth, which is Christ himself. I am the truth. A personal, holy, and a loving God is the reality revealed by the truth. I am the way, reconciliation. I am the truth, revelation. And finally, just a word on I am the life. And we may say regeneration. He is the life for all of those who believe in him, for all of those who have come to know him and come to love him. For all of those, he is the life. A.W. Pink once wrote, and I quote, The whole Bible bears solemn witness to the fact that the natural man is spiritually lifeless. He walks according to the course of this world, and he has no love for the things of God. The fear of God is not upon him, nor has he any concern for his glory. Self is the centre and circumference of his existence. He is alive to the things of the world, but he is dead to heavenly things. The one, he says, who is out of Christ exists, but he has no spiritual life. All my friends today, Christ can make such a person alive. He can. He promises to give this life to all of those who come to him and put their trust in him and the life that he promises to give is eternal life it is everlasting life because the life my friends that christ gives is god's life and because it is god's life it is life that cannot end it is something that cannot be taken away it is a life that you cannot lose the physical life you will lose, but this life of which Christ can give, you cannot lose it. It cannot be taken away. And so when you are on the way from total ruin to life, from death to life, that bridge is one way. There aren't anybody coming towards you on that bridge, coming the other way who are losing that life. No, my friends, it's one way. And once you're on that bridge, you cannot but go to the other side. And nobody can stop you, and nothing can stop you. It's life that cannot end. And Christ came that you and I might have life. You know, you might be trying to awaken yourself Maybe today, out of your spiritual lethargy, you might be trying to awaken yourself out of that lethargy by self-effort. Maybe you are trying from your own position of deadness and your position of total ruin. Maybe you are trying to find some other way, another bridge that you can take to, to reconcile yourself to God, another way to life. Maybe you are looking for another way to heaven. And you are finding and have found in your experience that every other way and every other bridge that you take, that they just fall and break right under your feet. The ropes, in a sense, they give way. And that will always be the case until you come to this bridge and until you come to trust in the one who is the way, the one whose way bridges this great chasm that has come between you and Almighty God. And that is a bridge, my friends, I can assure you, that will not give way under your feet. Why? Why will it not give way? Because, because its ropes are anchored in the truth. In the truth, which is Christ. And it will take you safely to the other side, where you will find life, everlasting life, where you will find that life in all of its fullness. And so today, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him is reconciliation, and revelation, and regeneration. And I pray today 
that each and every one of us who are listening today would find ourselves on this way and that we would walk in it. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the way that has been opened up for us. And we pray today that each and every one of us would seek to find ourselves on that way, uh, find ourselves following and looking to the one who could declare that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and the exclusive claim that he made that no one would come to the Father except they come through him who is the way. So bless us together. Forgive us for our sins. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Our concluding praise uh, comes from the Psalm 63, the metrical Psalm 63. And we sing from the beginning of the psalm, Lord, thee, my God, I early seek, my soul doth thirst for thee, my flesh longs in a dry parched land wherein no waters be. Say.